does any, and if, if you would, when you raise your hand, I'll give you the mic so everyone can hear you. Okay. Good evening, my name is Robert Davis. I live in Urban County, in Jim Crow particularly. Glad to see some fresh blood for the Urban County Commission. Thank you, sir. Matthew Shutter. Uh, when I applied for a gun permit, you shouldn't have to, because I have a right to carry it. It's a conflict. But when I went to apply for a gun permit to carry concealed, I was asked to watch in complete disregard of that the right their arms shall not be questioned. But they would not put civil right for the reason on my license to carry. How would you handle that situation if I came to you? Well, I would respect your you're right under Article 1, Section 21 of the Pennsylvania Constitution. Uh, I would respect your right under Article 1, Section 21 of the Pennsylvania Constitution, which states you have a right to bear arms in defense of yourself and the state. And it shall not be questioned. Uh, I would do, I run a background check with the Pennsylvania State Police. And if that came back clear, uh, I would all say smile for the camera, and here's your here's your gun permit with like a like I stated, no charge, because I believe the county should charge, okay, for your right. And Miranda versus Arizona, the Supreme Court rule, uh, ruled that the government cannot charge you for a right. They can't license a right. They can't, uh, you know, so there is some precedence there. And the United States Supreme Court agrees with me. It's unfortunately, you know, the state Republican uh, legislature, the House and the Senate that's run by Republicans, and the Pennsylvania courts uh, do not, you know, but like I, like I stated, you know, Miranda versus Arizona said that the government could not license or permit a right. So I would I would honor that and hand you your license. Offenders. 
um, for legalizing. Uh, I think that's for legislators. But I myself, I really don't like, I, I, you know, a lot of people might say they want it, but uh, I, I think it's one of those things that if you try it and then it's going to move on to something else. And that's my opinion. But like I said, uh, the best people to try to get that answer from would be the one that just left or, you know, some of the other legislators that work on those bills. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I gotta figure out what the proper distance is. I'm used to being over at the Redneck Festival where I have this thing kind of hooked to my chin for 25 hours. The county prison, I'd like to know, first question would be, how many repeat offenders do we have in there? So, if, and, and, and I've heard the number thrown around that it's like 75%, that there's a bunch of people who go and get themselves in trouble so that they have a nice, warm, cozy place to stay during the winter time. Well, quite frankly, that ain't right, as far as I'm concerned. The county prison population fluctuates throughout different times of the year. Sometimes you read in the paper how they're, they're busting at the seams, and, and other times they've got room to spare. I personally like Sheriff Apio over there in Arizona. Put them in tents and make them wear pink underwear. <laughs> I, you know, why aren't we holding these people accountable for their actions? Treating them like children is not going to solve the problem here. And certainly paying for their bad decisions just makes us end up paying more in the long run. In terms of marijuana, now, I don't, I don't smoke marijuana. But uh, I used to know a fellow who did. He was a happy fellow. I'll tell you that. But he ate a lot. I think marijuana should be sold out of the state stores just like alcohol is, regardless of your opinion on the state stores. But they should sell it out of the state stores, tax the living heck out of it, and pay off our damn debt. Yeah. You know, there's a black market making billions of dollars on what is relatively an innocuous drug. And if people are going to drive under the influence or public intoxication or whatever you call it when they're high, treat them the same way you do drunk drivers. Make them accountable for their actions. But if they're doing it in the privacy of their own home and not bothering anybody else, who cares? Thank you. Yeah, just bringing, bringing up uh, the previous two gentlemen, is population, the population of what's in the prisons in that, in that uh, and that number, that head count, I don't think is even in any of the paperwork that we've received or we've been even able to view. As far as the expenditure and the, um, the budget for the prison, that's just right underneath the general fund, so we don't even know that number firmly. But as far as the marijuana ordeal, it's a big tax income. If they do, if they would tax it, it would be a big tax income, and it would help get rid of the debt like everybody else is thinking. And we're in the needs of some site, some types of supplemental income so we can you know, further the, the government issues that we have going on. So as far as supporting, I can't say I'm in support of it, but as far as the legislation supporting it, that would be up to the higher, higher uh, levels of our government, and that's only going to be passed down into the county levels of what we can use the funds for would be governed and everything by the county levels, and I think it would be an income, to, a produ income produced to support the tax basis of the, any county and anyone involved. Um, outside of the, you know, the, the, the prison, I, I can't uh, touch base on anything about how many people are in, how many people are, how the cost of it or anything like that, so I really wouldn't want to comment on that. Okay, thank you. I'm going to try to limit the answers a little bit, okay? But, you know, I want to give everybody the opportunity to, you know. Okay, any, another question. Okay, so what I'm saying is, is I'll give you a minute to respond, okay? Because that seems to be inadequate. I'm basically, you know, taking an average. All right, thank you. My name's Gail Stroll, and I live in Haiti. And first, I'd like to make a uh, comment that making marijuana legal is a stupid idea, okay? I'm sorry, I'm like really aggravated. I was fine up until that last answer. It does lead on to other things. I can tell you personally from family experiences, 
But what I'd like to know, because all the things that have been tried and done as far as getting in control with the, with the drugs in that, in this area, does not work. They brought a, um, a speaker here from Montgomery County that does the drug court. I listened to them. They seem to have somewhat of an answer. It was asked to be brought into Cardin County. It was shut down by the county commissioners. I'd like to know from Adam Weaver, as well as from the candidates that are running for commissioners, what your feelings are on the drug court issue. I agree with you fully. Uh, I know it was back in, I think, 2013 when the recommendation was made. There was a committee formed of private volunteers that did recommend uh, drug treatment work. I do support us looking at that. I think we got to try some new additional approaches. Uh, part of it is we do have a county intermediate punishment committee set up that's supposed to consist of the court, uh, the commissioners, the county jail, the district attorney's office, public defender's office, and even citizen input. Uh, the, the, the budget, you can actually look up the budget type questions where you on uh, Pennsylvania Sentencing Commission. 2014, we had a budget of $4.3 million. The, the amount of inmates coming through our county system is 1,077 per year. So that's about 2% of our population that's running through Carbon County Prison. So, and the, the system's set up where you have to provide some sort of treatment to these inmates when they first come into the county prison. You have 90 days from their first get in there in which you give them an assessment. And then within 45 days, they have to start some sort of treatment plan. That's required under the Pennsylvania Code. Uh, recently, we just put a drug treatment counselor, the county put a drug pre treatment counselor in 2015. So it took us a while to get there for, for the county. The, the issue is, you know, in the meantime, we're putting people in housing and jail for 135 days, costing the taxpayer $60 a day. Uh, to put them in there, and we're not having an early enough of assessment of the defendants when they first enter the system. That's something a that drug treatment court would, of course, alleviate. You know, there's also a house arrest, which is a constant issue that comes up as to whether or not we're using it. Uh, that's usually $15 a day. That's less than the $60 we're currently paying. A lot of sentences actually impose upon the defendant to pay that. So it's bringing revenue in. Uh, there's county intermediate punishment programs. You could force them to go down to Carbon County and Sterling and actually say, see what type of job you can qualify for. Why don't you go start becoming a productive member of society? So I think it's really a drug treatment court either through that or our county intermediate punishment programs. I think we got to have a sit and make round table discussion, see what the costs are, what options are available. Does drug treatment court make sense? You'd have to look at the financials, definitely. You don't want to do anything that costs us too much money, but you want to look at that in comparison to what we're currently paying for. Thank you very much. Um, I, I sort of do like the idea with it because two years ago I, I actually spoke at the, the Carbon County Drug and Alcohol Program and there was actually two people there that one lost a, a son and another one lost uh, a husband. So with, with the way that they have it set up with this court system, there's sort of like three different levels of it. And when you go into that, it's better because you get, you'll have like the severe that you might have the jail longer. You know what I mean? Because like you had said before, they go in and they just go in for three months and just for a rest. So those are the people that have to have a longer term. But the first time offenders are the ones that need the help. So there are three different steps. And if you look at it, there are some states that do this, and it actually does help reduce on the budget. And our budget is for the for the prison here pretty close, like four, I think it's four point three million dollars, and that's not acceptable. You know what we pay a judge to sit on the bench in Carbon County? One hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year. And you want another judge? Look at all the staff that goes along with it. Court reporters, security, support staff. You're looking at another half a million dollars added to an already taxed budget. When just a few years ago, we added a third judge into Carbon County. 
spend a million and a half dollars renovating the courthouse, building out a new courtroom, and adding all that extra staff. We need to find a way to make do with what we have instead of expanding government.
and one of the other two judges to act as the leadership role in that. Um, but I, I think it's something that could be viable, and I know you hear the word drug court, and a lot of people think that's a whole new court that you set up. It's really not. It's just a, a, something called a problem-solving court. And us lawyers tend to get a little fancy with the words. Like we try to set up things like motions court or even something involved in like domestic relations to kind of get rid of the adversarial process in a legal proceeding to just kind of get to the get to the get to the problem. How can we solve it in a non-adversarial role? But really, it's about setting up policies and procedures just to streamline the process such as identifying offenders when they first get into the system as opposed to waiting 135 days before we determine, you know, are they getting treatment in our county prison. At the same time, we're paying for it there. But we do have a program. We just started the pilot program where offenders are being released directly from the prison rate, applying for Medicaid to get that drug treatment that they started. And that's something that could be extended either through the drug court type process to make sure they have insurance. But that's the biggest issue is you get these inmates into prison for 30 days and all of a sudden they don't have Medicaid coverage anymore. Uh, they get dropped. So that's at least a new decent program that we have just started going, like I said, in, in this year. So I think we're on the track to start new things. The question is, you know, we just got to have the vision and just keep going and plugging away with it. You know, I'm not going to say I know the exact answer right now on how to deal with it, but we've got to try stuff. And if we're not trying stuff, we're not figuring out stuff on how it works and we're just going back the same way. As always, and as the newspaper indicates, you know, the track we're going is just more drug offenders, more repeat offenders. You know, we got to try something new, whether it's using county intermediate punishment, house arrest more often, looking into drug court, seeing what grants. I know the grants aren't competitive in order to get that, but it doesn't mean it's not worth considering or at least putting it at the table. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Good evening. My name is Charles Gates, and I'm sure you know I was a county commissioner, so I showed up here. <laughs> but my statement is this. I've heard the candidates for commissioner up there, and I'm impressed. And I don't know which one of you said that, you know, let's stop the politics and hire people. Well, let me tell you what has happened with the three commissioners right now. And they're not here, but I wish they were. But I'm going to address it anyway. Not too long ago, they got rid of our foreign preservation director. And let's go back about four years ago. The new commissioner who's up there said he believed in hiring people from the county. So what happened? They got rid of our foreign preservation director. And let me tell you how it happened. Former Commissioner Tommy Gillard called one of the commissioners and said, would you vote with my boy to get rid of this director? Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty loud, I know. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I'll do that. So I happened to speak to him on the phone. I said, why would you do that? He said, well, this person never supported me in the election. I said, that's a damn good reason. I said, didn't this county go through a lawsuit for $700,000 because of political firing? And you voted that way, and he did. So what did they do? They hired somebody from Lehigh County to come up here to do that job. So what happened to hiring within the county? I guess it's like Mr. Shooter said up there, the good old boys. It's who you know, if you're a politician, you know you're going to get the job. But that isn't right. You know, and I'm going to say this right here and now. I'm sure you all know that I retired, and I gave a certain gentleman my, my seat. And let me tell you, if I could go back, I would have never done that, because I'm not very happy with what is going on right now. But let me say this. Come May of the year, that I retired, I found out that my wife had cancer. Well, I want to thank everybody for 
for the prayers because now she's cancer free. So the reason I tell you is, come May, I would have been retired anyway. But we have three candidates up here right now that I feel could do a good job. I'm sick and tired of hearing they hired this person, they hired that person. And some of these people are not qualified. You know, we all can't make the right decisions. And you know what? I probably made some decisions that were wrong. But you know what? Don't lie to the people. Right. Amen. Don't lie to the people. We have a situation, and I'm going to tell you without mentioning any names. I'm sure you read the paper that the commissioner is saying, we can't get any lifeguards up at Mock Chalk Lake. Well, how many people are here know the real reason? Okay, everybody that works at Mock Chunk Lake Park quits. And there's one reason. I'm not going to tell you what that is. But the people who know, know what the reason is. It's not because the county's not paying the money. Because the person in charge, everybody that works up there quits. You can't have that. It got that bad last summer. Carbon County left people in to Mock Chung Lake Park because there was no lifeguards. What do you think the county lost in revenue? I have no idea. But don't you think it's time and stuff like that happens? You gotta do something. You can't let it go. Believe me, I had a bus business. If you would come in to drive for me and you keep coming late, it would happen two times. The first time I tell you, the second time is hit the road and finish. I mean, this is the stuff that's going on in Carver County, and people don't realize it. They don't realize it. I'm going to tell you another situation. They have put the parking fees on weekends up to $10. Now, maybe you might say that's a lot of money. So what did they do? They brought it back down. Why did they bring it back down? And this came from a commissioner because they were threatened by the people, the business people on Broadway. Well, we put you in there. Maybe we can take you out. But what did they do? They took the weekday parking fees from three dollars to five. Guess who usually pays that? You people sitting there when want to do business in the courthouse or in the annex. That's who picked up the slack. And you know what, commissioners? Let's start thinking about the people, not getting reelected. Thank you.
But anyway, we're, we're in an informational age. So let's start with Adam and head left to right if you don't mind. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you, it's been a while since I looked up, you know, the, the right to know request laws. I do know you're, you have the ability to do it. And uh, I know one thing that I'd be curious to know about a little bit more is the, uh, the what, what's been going on with the prison inspections and everything else along those lines. And that's probably something that I really want to get to know and, and do my little probably right to know request in that regard. But like I said, I, I think we would have to go through the channels and a, a right to know request and I hate to give you a legal lease answer, but I do know you're aware you're allowed to do that. And uh, I think we got to keep some better statistics, too, especially in some of the uh, Carbon County prison statistics are really coming on. Now, I know it's tough to get the true recidivism rate of repeat offenders, but I think uh, we got to do a better job of keeping the, the statistics available. Well, I'm running for Carbon County Corner, so I mean, I don't have the legal background. Answer, answer. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, my job is to do the right to know act or, uh, or anything like that. So, I mean, I'd have to ask a lawyer or a DA to work with the county to find an answer for you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do that under my jurisdiction as a coroner office. I'd have to agree. I'm also at the coroner's office. Uh, there is certain information that is allowed to be put out. Uh, there's other information that is not allowed to be put out. It would have to be a legal opinion, and I'd have to go over the right to know in order to uh, determine what information is allowed to be released. Uh, they're probably correct, but having a background in managing the corner office, I know the answers to this. Um, under the County Code Title 16, by the 30th of every January, the corner's office is required to turn over all of their official papers and records to the defined area for the preceding year, uh, i.e., January 30th of 2016, all of the coroner's office records from 2015 must be turned over to the sanitary. At that point, it's public record, you wouldn't ask for it. Um, from the coroner's office aspect, in the current calendar year, um, if it is a closed investigation with the redaction of some protected health information, I would have no objection to releasing it to you. If it is an open investigation, i.e., as the coroner, I have not ruled on the cause and manner of death, being that it's an open, potentially criminal investigation, I would not release really that information until I've been ruled upon. Just to restate my, my statement. Yes. I'm asking if it has the right to know, if it is a document that we're allowed to have. Sure. Do you, are you going to make us ask for it, or will you publish it before it's asked for? Just open it, publish the information. Um, in the coroner's office? No disrespect, but I'm not going to publish everyone's death information. If there is a specific investigation you're curious about, I will release it upon request. However, I'm not going to release detailed uh, examination photographs and notes and reports for anybody in the county. I don't think that would be right if, you're, if you had your loved one's information spread all over the news just because we had the investigation or to anyone who asked for it. If it was asked for, it was a closed investigation based on the right to know, and Section 1256 of the County Code which pertains to the coroner's office, we would be required to produce it at that point, but I would not share the part of the language laundry of every death we investigated. I know that you get a you know, record is posted in the paper every year on our uh, the number of calls we have, what they are. Didn't come out yet this year. We're still waiting for 2015. But we have a lot of open cases in 2014 yet. So that's probably why it didn't come out. But I know he has it ready to go out. And uh, if it's a uh, closed, closed case, it's basically a public record and anybody can see it. I really wish Rick Beck was here to answer this question. But I do know that. He would want people to know everything that they possibly can unless it's going to jeopardize a case. But I think as long as there's something that can be said without ruining the entire case, he would want people to know. Uh, yeah, basically I can't speak for Mr. Manoli, um, but basically I'm just going to say generally the same thing she said. <laughs> Yes, absolutely, I would. Uh, libertarians believe in transparency. If I'm uh, lucky enough to be your sheriff, I work for you. 
Um, I, I think if anybody has ever come to any of my meet our meetings at the school board, uh, I probably talk for about 20 minutes on issues, and I give you a financial and whatever anybody needs. So if there's anything that you need to know that, I, I mean, there's certain things that apply to the HIPAA law, and, and you know, I, I know, Dave, you're always asking for things like that, but there's certain things that you cannot say because the next thing we're going to be in a $2 million lawsuit with somebody and it's going to cost the taxpayers that money. And if anybody ever asks me a question that is within, if we did it at a board meeting, now if there's something that's an executive session that you can talk personnel, you, you can't give that up. You're opening up for litigation. And any, anything else in that, and I said, everybody's come to the board meetings that I've been at for three years and they're going to ask me any question that's been discussed, financial, whatever it is, and I'll give them the information. I mean, but if you go in and there's a legal right to it, then you should get it through the HIPAA law. And, and if, it, if you don't, the, I mean, with a, you know, that it doesn't pertain to the HIPAA law, but if you don't get the information, then it's my personal business. Well, folks, the way I figure it, you paid for that information to begin with. And we've got a wonderful technology out there called the Internet. We've got three full-time people working up there in Jim Thorpe in what's called the Internet Technology Department. Why isn't this stuff put online? Why aren't all the minutes from their meetings put online? Unless it's confidential information, there's no reason it shouldn't be available to the public in the easiest source possible. It saves us the trouble of having staff to deal with your right-to-know request, doesn't it? So, should save money, put it out there. The right to know is the right to know. The only way it's not the right to know is if it is some way sealed. That's how you have to look at it. If it's the right to know, it should be out there. You know, even back to this fire, you know, talking about the firemen. 
I don't, I can't even make a response on that up there in Escajone because I, I see that a lot of them, they're asking the townships what they feel. I think it's up to the firemen. You know, you're the guys that are putting your life on the line. And I think there should be a committee and say, okay, can Tamenzi make it up there? Or, or is there a plan that if you're up there training, does somebody cover for you? Is there enough room? And that's what it's going to take to get that. Not, not where it's going to be or how much it costs. It's like that the whole county works to get it. And that's the key, the fire. Not, I, I can't make that decision. You're the one that's going out in the fire, not me. Thank you again for coming out. We appreciate it.